So uh, I'm Dervla Grace. I'm qualified from chemical engineering in UCD just a few years ago. Um, I kind of, while I was in college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I didn't apply for any jobs during my final year. I kind of had an idea I wanted to go abroad. I really wasn't sure. So when I did finish college, I had to, it took me a while to find a job. I gave up even on applying for jobs in Ireland. I saw the chemical engineering magazine and I applied for a job in the UK and it ended up being a job in Swords Labs in the maintenance department. And I, at that stage, I'd take any job um, just to get into the industry. Actually, I got offered a job or a PhD in UL at the same time. And I thought it was a great opportunity to start in the pharmaceutical industry because it's so big in Ireland. So I took the job in Swords Labs. So that was kind of an active pharmaceutical industry job. Um, it was a large multinational. They had a few sites, but it was a contract job. And with temporary contracts, they don't last very long. So that only uh, covered my work experience for uh, nine months. It was a good way to get in. Uh, maintenance people know a lot and they're great people to learn from. And it's a good, I got my foot in the door and I met people. So that's how I got my second job, which was in their other site in Cruz Rath, again, in the maintenance department. That job I got myself through my contacts in Swords Labs. But uh, like these big companies, when they're doing projects, they sometimes don't want to take people on on their own payroll. So they asked me to be a contractor for them. So instead of working for Swords Labs, I worked for, or I didn't work for, I worked through PM Group as a contractor. So I was paid, I had to invoice each month and be paid that way. Um, but maintenance really wasn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in production. So after I'd done my first, my six month contract in maintenance through my contacts that I had made, I got myself a job in the production department. It was great. It was a new site. If you can get yourself a job in a new site, it's always great because you set the standard for that site. There's no, nothing that came before. It's all new. There's no way, old ways of doing things. You can set the new ways of doing things. And that's what they did in Cruise Rat uh, at the time. So uh, again, I moved the production department. That was good. So I was kind of writing standard operating procedures, commissioning equipment. Um, so it was a bit more towards the chemical engineering that I knew about and wanted to do. But it was a contract and contracts always come to an end. After that, I still was looking for more, um, more process experience. I wanted to be a process engineer. So I found a job as a cleaning and process validation in Wyatt at the time. So Wyatt is no longer Wyatt, it's now Pfizer, out in Grange Castle. It's a, again, a huge, large multinational. It's a biopharma industry. So I was working in drug substance. So drug substance is the active ingredient that they make. And then they go into drug product and drug product is what the, the syringes or the tablets or that kind of thing. Um, so drug substance is where they make the bulk active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, that's where I did some shift work. So it was um, staying up all night to take samples, water samples. Again, really wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was a means to an end to get experience. So I got great experience there um, of the pharma uh, biopharmaceutical industry of um, uh, uh, biopharma reactors, starting from cell culture all the way through to having the final product at the end to go off to be made into drug product. Uh, again, I was working there as a contractor to a contract company. Um, which is one of the ways you can work. That again, as a contract, it came to an end, but I didn't really want to stay there anyway because I wanted more process experience. So I moved to Schwartz Pharma, which became UCV. All these, as you will see here, there's a pattern of companies changing names. This one was a much smaller company, so it was family owned. So. One of the things between a smaller company and a bigger company is big companies, your job is very small. 
because there's a lot of people and each person has their own specific role within the company and they're very uh, structured. Smaller companies, there's a lot of work to do and not so many people to do it. So your job can be a lot more varied. You could be doing one thing one day and another thing another day. It's, it's as opposed to doing the same task every day. Again, it was active pharmaceutical ingredient, uh, industry. Again, lots of nice chemistry. If you like things that go fizz and pop, there was a hydrogenator, there was Grignard reactions. So there I started off as a process engineer. And we, the, for the first year it was more the day-to-day -day operations of the plant, keeping it running, new product introductions, but they decided to shut down the plant and uh, redesign it. So I was part of the design team then with lots of trips to the engineering house down in Cork. Um, so that was my first time I had to travel for work. So there was lots of early morning flights and travel for work is, is great in the beginning, but when you can, you've eaten your way through the menu in a hotel twice, it, it's not so good anymore. Uh, again, this job was a contractor, but as you'll see, I've worked both contractor and in staff positions, and I've never really found a difference working. Working as staff, you get paid for holidays. Working as a contractor, you don't get paid for holidays. Some companies are very nice to their contractors. Some companies for tax and legal purposes have to keep them very separate. And you might have different prices in canteens and things like that, but that's, it's not because they don't like you. It's just that they're trying to keep um, things different to show for tax purposes that you're not working for them. Um, that, so Schwartz Pharma was in Shannon and I'm a dub. So I wanted to move back to Dublin. So after a few years in Schwartz, I came back to Dublin again. And I worked in another even smaller family owned company called, uh, well, started off with being health and chemicals. And again, it got bought out and became Clarichem, um, another active pharmaceutical industry. So in this role, I never would have applied for the job of a maintenance engineer. I wanted to be a process engineer. I did not want to work in maintenance again. I'd done my maintenance, but it was kind of, there was a bit of a downturn in the economy and this job was advertised and a, a recruitment agents put my name forward for it. And I thought, well, if I get in as a maintenance supervisor, I can move over to production once I get a little bit of experience. But actually when I went to do for the interview, I discovered the maintenance supervisor was actually the entire engineering department. Some days you were out being a maintenance technician, fixing, fixing the gate. So one day I had a funny day where I was negotiating the purchase of a new centrifuge to a new piece of equipment that was going to cost thousands, thousands of pounds. But then I had to go out and open the gate to let the, the sales rep off site because the gate was broken. So you can do all levels of things when it's a small company. This was a staff position. So the difference, I don't find a huge difference between contracting and staff. Contracting, you're paid by the hour. Staff, it just depends on the terms and conditions of the company you're working for. So you need to find that all out before you take a job. So I stayed in Clarechem for quite a number of years, but uh, um, all good things must come to an end. And I wanted to learn a bit more. I wanted to work with more people. So working on your own and covering all levels of uh, activity can be difficult too, because you don't have anybody to ask questions of. Um, so I moved into the consultants industry. So I tried a small consultancy as a project engineer. I branched out. Uh, it was in a small company, family owned again. So I didn't find enough people. So you see, I moved on, but it was a great way to learn about different industries. I was over in the UK. I was working in the Weedabix factory and I still eat Weedabix, which is always good. Um, and uh, some other um, factories over there. I got some more experience in finishing plants. So this is where the API would be, uh, was tableted or blended. Um, again, it was a staff position. So consultancy, in case you don't know what it is, is you're not actually working on a site that manufactures something. You're working in a design office that's designing 
things for other sites or being the project engineers for different sites um, and you move around jobs. So one week you could be working for one company, the next week you could be working for another company or you could be going in fixing a problem or doing a report for one company and doing something else for another company at the same time. So Malone Engineering, I didn't stay too long because I discovered I was the only chemical engineer. So I went to a bigger company with a multinational consultancy where I was a lead process engineer. So I was more back at my process engineering. I did more biotech projects there based on the experience that I had uh, previously gained from working in Wyatt. I obviously active pharmaceutical industry projects from all the projects I had worked on or all the sites I'd worked on before and finishing plant projects. So I find with consultancies, they're going to pick people for the jobs based on their experience because they have to prove to the client who's paying them to do the job that these people are the best people for them. So if you have a good uh, experience in the different industries, it'll be easier to be picked for jobs and always put your summer jobs and any jobs you've done on your CV because it shows people that you're willing to work and have worked. Again, I stayed with the staff position here. Um, but I stayed in PPS for a number of years. But again, I, I didn't really like consulting because you've got to be nice to all the different clients. You're meeting new people every day. You have to, to keep up the appearances because you're being paid by these different companies or your company DPS is being paid for them. So you're the face of DPS everywhere you go. So I, I jumped ship from DPS and I'm now working for Gerbe as a process safety engineer using all the bits that I've learned from all the different jobs. So the phys and pop chemistry from Schwartz Pharma, the how to do ATEX reports and the um, project work from DPS and Malone and things like that. Um, that kind of thing. Again, it's a multinational company in the active pharmaceutical industry and it's a staff position. And I just put one more slide together, you'll be happy to hear. Of all the different things that a chemical engineer can do and the different types of engineers that I've met over the years. So there's the process engineer, which we all wanted to be, or I know I definitely wanted to be. There's the project engineer, which is more, uh, can have process, projects but you can't have equipment projects so you could be an equipment engineer equally there's a validation engineer so validation is big thing in the pharmaceutical industry it's um checking that the equipment is installed and works as designed to work it can be a process technician or an operator and this is one that i I know I had recruitment agencies ringing me about when I graduated and it was something I was like, no, I'm an engineer. I don't want to be a technician. I don't want to be an operator. But some of my colleagues were technicians and operators and are now where I am now to um, management level. So a process technician or a process operator job is actually a great way to get in at low level and work your way up and learn from the bottom. Uh, you could be a maintenance engineer. Uh, looking after equipment, make sure keeping it running. Quality engineer, again, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, there's a lot to do with quality and good manufacturing practices and making sure the product going out the door is exactly what it says on the tin, essentially, and all the paperwork is right and there's no product recalls. You can be a process development engineer. So Every company has a different way of calling this. You could be a new NPI, new product introduction, NPD, new product development, and there's 101 other uh, three letter acronyms that you could be to for process development. So that's basically um, a startup. It could be also a startup engineer. Basically, when a new product is, is designed by the chemist in the lab, getting it onto the plant or moving a product from one manufacturing plant to another manufacturing plant. That's process development engineer. Safety engineer, I obviously advocate for this one. I'm particularly fond of process safety, but you could also go into the occupational health and safety. And that's basically peeping, people, peep, yeah, keeping people safe. Environmental engineer, uh, looking after the environment, making sure that the site 
is uh, keeping to the regulations and working as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, or a technical services engineer is again, you might be working in production as a process engineer or a production engineer, another one off the list. Um, technical services is just another word, word for engineering department. They're the, the engineers that kind of do little projects and process support and production support, but mightn't actually be working on the production floor. That is my presentation. So I'm going to hand over now to Derek. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Derek Morta. Um, I'm the business and strategy lead for the quality unit in MST Biotech Dublin. It's a large pharma plant out in Swords. Um, I'm here to kind of tell my story and mine is slightly different to the other guys who are going to talk here today. Um, my educational um, kind of, my education stopped at level eight. So I have a two one degree in applied physics, but I've still been able to have quite a distinguished career despite not having my level nine or anything like that. Um, and at this stage, I haven't got my chartership either. So I'll just take, take you through a quick summary of my um, career. Okay, so I graduated with my applied physical instrumentation from GMIT in 2006. And as a forward opportunity to work as an instrument engineer um, with Lotus Works. So I was in Pfizer Newbridge and also Pfizer Grange Castle. From there, I was probably 25 and I was, um, a friend of mine showed me a job in Australia. I was at the age where I was like, you know what, it's time to go traveling. I thought it was meant to be a six month job on the West Coast. Turned out being two years working as a commission and technician on Pluto LNG. Um, that was a $15 billion um, uh, startup um, liquefied natural gas plant. After that, um, I was asked to come along and stay another few years as a, a completions engineer slash system owner on the Gorgon LNG project. So I ended up spending nearly four years on that project. Um, a lot of it based out of Perth. So I'll talk a bit more about it later on, but that's actually a very interesting and intriguing job. Um, as time went by, I'm kind of um, my wife, who's an environmental scientist, she made me very aware of the damage that um, the LNG industry was doing to the environment. And I needed to kind of step away. And in 2016, my, my old manager from Pfizer contacted me and asked me, would it be interested in coming back and working in BMS um, as the instrument and predictive maintenance lead? Um, spent two to three years in, in BMS. And from there, um, my manager at the time, he moved out to MSD Biotech and he was the engineering director there and asked me to come on board as digital engineering lead. Um, been been here for probably two and a half years and um in the last two months i've moved into a new a kind of step out of my engineering discipline into the quality unit and it's looking after business strategy and how how we can develop as our quality unit and put us as best in class and become a kind of a service provider to other other sites around the network okay so a small bit about me so my employers um kind of as Deborah said there is there is an importance of contracting so for me, there's a difference between contracting and, and being staffed. And um, the contractors, um, yes, they do get um, a bit rougher treatment from their employers, but but they definitely get better paid. Um, the hourly rate is um, a lot higher as a contractor. The flip side, though, is if you are looking for job security, I'm I'm 37 now. I have a three month old baby. I'm looking for something there that I know the job is going to be there in 12 months time. And um, there's a lot to be said for working working for the company then. So working for um, in a staff position but as i said my career i've worked for lotus works i've worked for kent's chevron bristol Myers squibs and msd biotech okay um going on then just to show a small bit about my time in australia so i worked on two liquefied natural gas projects um on, on the west coast of australia one in the very northwest and um you'll see here kind of desert conditions this picture actually doesn't do justice to the actual size of this plant it's about about 16 square kilometers all up um, to walk from walk from the top end of um, the part of the train to the next end uh, to the, the bottom end where the flare is. It's a good 45 minute walk. Um, spent two years working there as a commission and technician, and I got a whole host of exposure to um, the process side. Um, ultimately, liquefied natural gas. Um, it's it's a fancy filtration system. It's heating, cooling, filtering um, gas coming out of the ground until you get to liquefied natural gas. You're able to condense it um, down to um, minus 180 degrees and then ship it around the world. Um, after that, I got the opportunity to move on to the Gorgon LNG project. My manager from Pluto asked him to come on board onto Gorgon LNG. You'll see the pictures there. Gorgon, it's a much bigger animal. Um, the complications with Gorgon is that it was a grade A nature reserve. So it was on an island off the West Coast. 
and you're actually only allowed 5,000 people on the island at any given time. Um, a project this size, if it was being built in the Middle East, would have had somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000 on, on board. Um, so for a lot of it, I worked out at the Pert, Pert Operational um, Center. Um, and a lot of the equipment that was built, it was modularized, brought in a barge, and effectively driven into place. These big structures that you see, there's 53 units all, all assembled together. Um, one, one big thing in my career um, of my time in Australia was I'm, I'm a home bird and I've always been home. So in the course of my time over there, I actually made 30 return trips to Australia. So that's effectively 61 way flights um, over the five years. Um, if you're into traveling, it's brilliant. It's a great experience altogether. Um, at the end of it, as Derval had, had alluded to, you do get sick of traveling. Um, you do get sick of going, going through the airports um, get sick of it, everything that goes with it, but it is enjoyable at the start of your career. Um, moving on then, when I, when I came home, um, I was afforded the opportunity um, to join my old manager in BMS Cruise Rat, um, working as the instrument and predictive maintenance lead there. So I spent two years there and the drug we were making there was, it's an immuno-oncology drug. Um, and I was actually, I was at a wedding last, um, last Thursday and father, father of the bride, um, he was effectively diagnosed with terminal cancer two years ago um, and was told he had six months to live. He was the last person leaving, leaving um, the, um, the, the wedding venue last week. He'd out, outlived and outlasted everyone. So the drug that's making there, it is truly revolutionary and it does give a great meaning. So um, one of the big things for me now at my, at my stage in my career, it's having a purpose to why I'm going to work and having something like that does, does have a lot going for me. Um, MSD Biotech Dublin, um, very similar to the startup that was BMS Crew Rat, um, very um, fast paced startup, um, dynamic. Um, but again, it's the product we're making. It's another cancer treatment drug and it does have significant impact on people that, that I do know. Um, so for me, a lot of my career, it's, at, as you get older, it's your purpose. It's no longer money, it's no longer travel, it's purpose and work-life balance. Um, that's my career in, in, in a snapshot, but what I probably haven't covered enough of and kind of the advice for anybody starting is um, progressing your career. So for me, the most important thing in, in your career, um, as I've said, I've, I've a level eight degree, um, not a very good level eight degree in terms of it's a second class honors. But for me, I've been able to network. I've been able to work with people. I've been able to, if somebody needed something done on the job, I'd, I'd go on my way to accommodate them, try and make it happen. Um, and that's always came back to, to me in time. So that person going on to the next job would realize, yeah, I have a good ethic about me and, and um, bring them with them. So, and I know you guys, a lot of you guys are going to be starting on your, um, on your career. And what is actually Googling um, this picture this morning for networking, the definition of a business network came up. So it's a group formed a commitment for the mutual benefit of each member of the group. Um, the big, big, big advice I'd give for you guys is make sure you stay in touch with each other. If someone does have a job um, and, and you have the opportunity to kind of point them, someone's looking for a job um, and bring them on board, I'd absolutely urge you to do that. Um, if someone rings up um, one day and goes, can you give me advice on what I'm doing here? Um, it will benefit in time if you do spend that bit of time with the people. Um, my, my big big success was I've never really needed to apply for jobs. I've always had people ask me to come work with them. So, and I attribute all that to my kind of social skills and my networking. Um, at this stage, I don't think we're doing questions. We're, um, we're gonna save them till the end. So I will hand this over to Jessica who should be up next. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, my name is Jessica Whelan. So currently I'm uh, an assistant professor or lecturer in the UCD School of, of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering. Uh, and Philip just asked me to maybe um, give folk an idea of, of my background. I suppose I've probably had a, maybe a, a slightly kind of, a, maybe atypical career path. So just, just to kind of give, give you an idea of that. So I suppose when kind of people, people ask me, um, I would often say I've had like a very blended career. Um, I suppose primarily I'm driven by curiosity. So, you know, I hear, something um you know about a kind of new or upcoming area or you know something that i just find interesting and haven't had the chance to do before and that usually kind of brings me down a, a certain path so 
as a result, kind of over, I think it's been about 20 years, nearly 20 years um, since I graduated from, from UCD, but I've spent a fair portion of my time in industry as well as a fair portion of my time in academia. And I personally, I really like sitting at that, that interface between the two. So just at a, I suppose, a very high level, my career path has been graduated 2002 from, from UCD, from ChemEng. I then went for a couple of years down to Merck in uh, Ballydyne, where I worked as a planning and manufacturing engineer. And I'll talk about each of these a little bit more in detail uh, going on. I then returned from uh, Merck in Carmel to take up a PhD again in the School of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering, and that led me on to some postdoctoral research in, in the same school. Um, at that time, there was a spin out coming out of the School of Chemical Engineering, and I joined there as the technical director and uh, I suppose ran the technical side of that organization for about five years, um, at which point I joined BMS Cruise Rat, so similar to, to Derek um, around the time that they were starting up the, the new Cruise Rat facility. So I worked there as associate director for the upstream ms and lab team for, for about three years. Um, and then back in February 2020, I, I suppose made my most recent move, which was again back to uh, the School of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering to, to take up the role as a, as a lecturer and a researcher uh, within the school again. Um, I suppose kind of looking at kind of each of the steps in my career to date. So, you know, the BE I found, um, I, like I really enjoyed uh, the course as it was, like it was definitely, you know, hard work at times. But again, I think the fact that it was hard work and that there was a small class, again, kind of similar to what Derek was saying, you know, you really built strong relationships with, with your classmates. Um, on top of that, I suppose, particularly I think UCD gives you a really strong foundation in engineering principles. Um, the school has very close relationships with industry. So again, you know, kind of going out into the workforce afterwards, you are carrying, I suppose, like a, a well-recognized degree with a, with a good reputation. And again, like during my time, but even much more so now, there is a blend um, of, I suppose, topics and subjects across both chemical and biological processes. And again, I think that's kind of very important. So, um, you know, within Ireland and, and worldwide, chemical engineers work or have the potential to work across so many different industries that the course I feel really sets you up well to pursue, you know, whatever aspect it is that, that you're interested in. So I suppose kind of when I completed the BE, like I had, as I said, always enjoyed the, the actual kind of topic of chemical engineering and, and the various subjects. And originally I had thought I might do a PhD, but to be honest, I, I had had enough of studying for, for a little while when I finished up. And I went on and I took up a role within uh, Merck in Clamel, as I said. So um, it was originally what was termed a planning engineer down there. And during my time there, I progressed to um, like a hybrid planning and manufacturing engineer. So really what my responsibilities were, were, you know, uh, I suppose, overseeing and uh, developing the, the documentation that was necessary to set up each campaign of each process. So, you know, you'd need uh, mechanical setups every time uh, the plant was being rearranged or reconfigured for, you know, the next process coming in. Um, you would need batch records, uh, you know, sampling plans and so on. So that was a large portion of, of the work. Also, I would have had responsibility for creating and managing the recipes that ran the automation on the plant. So there was an automation engineering role as well that would have been, I suppose, more focused on developing the components that went into the recipes, but the higher level recipes uh, I would have taken responsibility for. And then within the role of manufacturing engineer, it was everything that came with that. So managing the execution of the process, dealing with any like atypicals or deviations that, that occurred, um, you know, uh, dealing with the, the operators and liaising with them to get their feedback on how the process was running and figuring out ways to continuously improve that process. 
So I suppose the, the benefits were that I got experience working in a GMP environment. So, you know, as you're probably aware, Ireland is a real stronghold for pharmaceutical manufacture. All that has to be done in a, in a highly regulated GMP environment. So getting the experience of that environment early on in my career has really kind of stood me in good stead. So, you know, whether it has been in other industrial roles or within uh, some of the more academic positions I've taken up, um, the, I suppose, impact of GMP is something that I've kind of understood and been able to, uh, I suppose, weigh into whatever argument or, or plan or strategy I might be coming up uh, with for whatever problem or, or, or uh, project I might be working on. So Mark is focused on small molecule API manufacturers. So again, this is where uh, the chemistry, if you like, was the primary focus of um, what I was doing. Um, I really enjoyed the working environment. So again, I suppose kind of one of my big learnings kind of moving into to industry from the, the BE was the fact that it's very much team focused. So within the BE, there are definitely a number of, I suppose, team activities or, or, or team assessments and, and so on. But the vast majority of your work is solo. And that is quite different to, to the uh, industrial, I suppose, uh, environment. And I think Derek spoke really well um, to it. You know, a lot of your success in the industrial sense is based on your ability to network and, you know, kind of build relationships and to, you know, kind of work um, as a team. So I personally really enjoyed working as a team and, you know, learn, learned loads from, from that first position. However, I suppose while I was in Merck, what I did find was that I actually missed the, the core focus that I had had on science and engineering in UCD. So, you know, definitely the, the knowledge of the underlying science and, and engineering principles are, you know, really important. But a lot of the day to day work, um, I suppose, by virtue of the fact that you're in a GMP environment, was focused a lot on process, procedure, you know, documentation and so on. And, uh, you know, for myself, I, I did miss that focus on, on the science and engineering. So I suppose with that, I uh, made a decision after about two years to return to UCD and to pursue a PhD. So, again, I suppose I'd always had a strong interest in like biological processes. Um, in my day, it has changed a lot, but in my day, it was a very small element of the um, of the BE, but it was something I really wanted to explore further. So I got the opportunity to work with Susan McDonnell and Brian Glennon on a project looking at the development and optimization of mammalian cell cultures um, at large scale. You know, you'll, you'll talk to 100 different PhD students or, or PhD graduates and, and you'll get 100 different answers, but for me, certainly doing the PhD was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, you know, the I suppose the good of it was definitely, you know, I got that opportunity to focus on things I was specifically interested in. So biological processes, um, you have a lot of, I suppose, opportunity to influence the direction that the project takes. So, you know, that freedom to explore and develop the project based on your own interests was something I, I really relished. Um, it also, I suppose, gave me the opportunity to develop some of the most important relationships and, and friendships of my life. So again, you know, the PhDs, like on an emotional level, there's lots of ups and downs, you know, there's times when the research is going well and, you know, you can see the results coming in. And there are times when you feel like you're beating your head off a wall for, you know, months on end. Um, and I think that kind of shared experience with other PhD students, uh, I suppose, really, really bonds you. And, and they're still like my best friends uh, to, to this day. As well as that, I also got to, I suppose, interact with uh, other members of the School of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering, as well as people within external industry. And some of those relationships have, I suppose, followed me through my, my career to date. Um, Again, kind of doing the PhD, it is like a, about a four year project. So apart from the, I suppose, the, the core technical project, you also develop a really broad range of skills related to, you know, project management, lab management, um, 
and, and lots of other aspects. And these are, I suppose, uh, skills that have come up and I've used again and again throughout my career. So I really kind of feel that for me doing that PhD was, I suppose, fundamental to, uh, uh, I suppose, equipping me for kind of what came, came in, in the future in my career. So after the PhD, it, it was four and a half years, so uh, I went climbing. So I lived in a camper van for a year and traveled around Europe and then on to Australia and New Zealand. Um, again, I suppose I kind of feel that like chemical engineering and, and the path I was going, you know, I do really enjoy chemical engineering, but there are lots of other aspects of life I, I, I enjoy. And kind of something I found is that I've always managed to end up um, as, as I change job, kind of, you know, doing something unrelated to work that, that I've really enjoyed. So after Mark, I went to Southeast Asia for about three months before I came back to the PhD. After the PhD, I went climbing for a year. Um, I then came back and I uh, took up a position of uh, postdoctoral researcher, again with Brian Glennon in chemical engineering. So this project was, I suppose, continuing to build the, the skills I developed during the PhD. It was an industry-led research project, so I very much enjoyed the fact that we had, uh, I suppose, an industry advisory panel that, you know, kind of reviewed our progress on the research, kind of gave us advice uh, on what they felt, you know, would be good directions to go to make it um, applicable and relevant to industry and so on. And, you know, for myself, I'm quite goal oriented. I'd like I like to see um, a near term application of, of the work and the research I'm doing. So I really enjoyed that. Ultimately, myself and the PhD student, Stephen Craven, who was working alongside me at the time, developed a PAT-enabled uh, control system for uh, an upstream mammalian cell culture reactor. So uh, that platform we developed, so it used RAM and to monitor what was going on inside the bioreactor. And I just have a picture of the bioreactor that we worked on here. So it was a 10 litre that's in the basement of, of the engineering building still today. Um, but that platform that we developed, uh, I suppose, was the advice from the industry advisory board was that it was, you know, a really useful kind of platform and capability that we had developed. So the next step I took and Stephen took it a lot al alongside me was to move to APC. So that was a spin out that uh, Brian Glennon and one of his then postdocs, Mark Barrett, um, generated out of ChemEng. But I joined them following that 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 postdoc and after two months of yoga in India uh, to become the the technical director there so I joined very early on I was I think employee number nine and by the time I left five years later we had grown to 110 people so it, like I have to say it was kind of probably like the busiest and most exciting times of of, of my life in APC um, it was just, I suppose, uh, thrilling and exciting to have the opportunity to apply, you know, what we had developed in, in an academic sense and to see that, I suppose, benefit, um, you know, many tens, if not hundreds of, of uh, molecules and medicines that, that would eventually supply patients. Um, my role there was to oversee the technical department and all the projects that were executed within that department. So we worked for a broad range of pharmaceutical companies from, you know, the large multinationals that, that everyone would know their names of right the way down to virtual companies that might be 30 or 40 people employed worldwide. Um, just the, the range of projects I got to, you know, see and work on was, you know, amazingly broad. So certainly I developed um, technically, but also I suppose one of the things I really enjoyed about working in APC as I suppose what was initially a small startup and is now a well-established medium-sized company was really kind of getting a a good insight into like the business um, development side. So, you know, how to start a business, grow a business, uh, maintain that business. And really, I suppose what I took away from that is that like a lot of the skill sets you develop as a chemical engineer. So, you know, your ability to collect data, analyze that data, you know, draw strong, robust conclusions from the data are amazingly valuable. So not both within 
um, you know, technical engineering problems, but also within a wide range of applications like, you know, kind of growing a business and, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, like definitely. And I know a lot of my classmates went on to, you know, roles that weren't, we'll say, pure play chemical engineering and, and they would have felt the same. So so the, the foundation we get is, is great. <laughs> Oh, someone someone has a baby that, that 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 sounds like like me a couple of years ago so um after apc um i suppose or while i was working in apc i saw um you know a lot of development on the biopharmaceutical side around dublin so uh one of those companies was bms and they were building a 1 billion uh, euro facility um out in in cruise rats so kind of around the the blanchardstown area of dublin so for myself, um, just the the opportunity to, I suppose, again, kind of join something that was new and starting up and the energy and excitement that comes like that really appealed, um, as well as, I suppose, the opportunity to see a lot of what I had kind of worked on, like at the lab scale, executed at the large scale. So again, I just felt it was a, a good opportunity and, you know, just something I was really curious um, to see kind of up closer. Um, it was a really good opportunity to, to kind of, I suppose, dive into the, the manufacturing side of biopharmaceuticals. So I joined there as the associate director for the ms &T upstream technical team. So this is um, the team's responsibility would have been to, I suppose, provide technical input to facilitate the, the execution of processes at scale. So we would have been based in the lab, but doing experiments or analysis that would, um, if or that did, if you like, kind of determine how the process will be executed when it went up to the 15,000 litre scaling in cruise wrap. So again, it was a really exciting time. Um, you know, there were definitely technical challenges and technical projects that I, I was working on and using, I suppose, what you would consider typical like engineering um, skill sets. But also, again, you know, kind of some of the highlights were around the the opportunity to build the team. So again, you know, kind of when I joined, one of my first jobs was to recruit um, a lot of additional members into that upstream technical team. So, you know, uh, interviewing, recruiting, developing the team dynamic, again, was, you know, kind of really rewarding. Uh, when we first started, we just had a, a satellite lab in Nybert. So again, a lot of the work was uh, getting to spend a lot of money buying a lot of equipment and, and setting up the lab from scratch as, as the building came online. And then there was also, I suppose, um all the the insight that i gained from working on a startup facility transferring in a process and then also in in kind of parallel and, and not necessarily directly related to that site there was like opportunity to work on global projects so such as characterization of next generation processes so again that opportunity to influence you know what will come next what are the significant improvements you could make to to a process and and, and bring that on so as I said, that kind of brought me to, to my current position. So again, back in, in February kind of uh, 2020, uh, an opportunity to came up to return to the School of Chemical and Bioprocess Engineering. And I suppose both through my undergrad, my postgrad and my postdoctoral research, I I'd spent a lot of time in, in the school. It was and still is somewhere that's always been kind of very, very close to my heart. So, um, as, as the opportunity came up, I decided I, I was interested in it. I suppose what appealed to me is that the kind of role within the school is like really varied and flexible. So what I like about it is that, you know, you have the freedom again, kind of similar to during the, the PhD and the postdoc to like explore and kind of set up your career in line with your own personal interests. So for myself, I'm interested in biological processes. So both biopharmaceuticals and cell and gene therapies. So, you know, as I join, um, you know, there's no one who tells you, you have to research this or you have to research that, you know, provided you can, you know, come up with good project proposals and get funding, you have the opportunity to, to drive your research and your work in whatever uh, direction you want. 
Um, and then apart from the research, there's also like various teaching and administration, I suppose, aspects of the role. And again, the the teaching personally, I find rewarding, you know, I suppose, helping out students who you see kind of setting out on on their, uh, I suppose, journey within chemical engineering. Like a lot of students, I think, by by virtue of the fact that I've had quite a, a mixed career, you know, often if there's students who are kind of torn between will they do a PhD or go to industry, I have the opportunity to, you know, kind of chat and, and mentor those students a little bit. Um, as well as, I suppose, like teaching kind of keeps you in touch with maybe some, some of the core elements of, of engineering that as I moved further into, into management um, through APC and, and the roles in BMS, I got a little further away from. So yeah, um, it, it's, a, I suppose, a, a, a great job with lots of, of uh, I suppose, variability in it. And again, that's kind of what I personally like because that's what keeps me interested and, and keen to come to work. So that's a, a whistle stop tour of, uh, I suppose, what I've done to date. I'll hand over to the to the next presenter and I'm more than happy to take questions as part of the panel. So yeah, evening everyone, first of all. So um, yeah, my name is um, Kieran Finnerty. Um, my current position is uh, Senior Manager Site Reliability s and &E in Cruiser App Biologics. Uh, so you'll see that uh, Jessica and Derek have, have also worked there as well. Um, my education, uh, I'll have to disappoint Shane, I'm not actually a chemical engineer by, by qualification, um, but I, I think you see the, the common theme amongst everyone who's presented your academic qualifications doesn't necessarily dictate your career path and I think my story is no different. So I actually have a Master's of Science in Subsea Engineering from the University of Aberdeen and um, that followed on from a, a B.Eng in Civil Engineering I also done at Aberdeen and uh, I had originally done a BTEC in civil and environmental engineering in DIT Bolton Street, which is obviously now TUD. Um, my career experience in a nutshell, I spent seven years um, working in the offshore and oil and gas industry with uh, companies um, Can Offshore, Saipem, Sub-C7 and Shell. And um, I've more recently spent five years in the biopharmaceutical industry with BMS. and. Um, just some other CPD there. I, I recently got my chairship with Engineers Ireland this year, and uh, I'm a CRL and CMRP, which are the qualifications within the reliability and maintenance field. Um, so I guess summarizing the, my, my early part of my career, um, I initially attended going over to Aberdeen only for two years to, to finish off my BEng. Uh, kind of led into a master's in subsea engineering, very much oil and gas orientated. And from that, um, I guess there wasn't much opportunity for work at, at home in Ireland at the time. And the oil and gas industry was, was absolutely booming in, in Aberdeen. And it is the, the oil and gas hub of Europe. Uh, so I ended up <laughs> spending another seven years there, uh, mostly based in Aberdeen, but also London uh, as well. And um, while I was mostly Office based, I spent a considerable amount of time working offshore uh, in the North Sea and the, in the Atlantic, actually on the on the Carib uh, gas field off, offshore Mayo. Um, in the North Sea, I was working on dive support vessels um, with saturation divers, typically working at depths of about 200 meters. Um, you're probably at the limits of saturation diving at around 200. Uh, anything beyond that you, you need remotely operated vehicles to, to go to deeper uh, depths so uh, Corb was an example of that um, around 300 meters so we had to get ROVs down there. Um, I also worked on, on remote projects across the globe in, in Baku, Venezuela, uh, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico and also west coast of Africa as well. So I guess the, some of the skills and an engineering skill sets I developed during that time, I guess work ethic and resilience been been the main one, I would say. Um, there were times where I had to spend six weeks at a time offshore, uh, 42 days straight. To, you know, they tended to be 12 hour shifts, but the 12 hour shifts tended to go on into 14, 15 hours. Um, so that was quite, quite testing. Um, and it was really important that 
he had good interpersonal skills and good communication skills working in an environment like that. Um, you know, when people are off, offshore for that length of time, um, you know, th there can be quite um, difficult situations to maneuver and, and tensions do become heightened. Um, so it's very important that you, you get to, to work with your colleagues um, and, and have good, good communication skills there. So I also I would have de developed a lot of transferable engineering skill sets, you know, um, like such as project management, um, technical writing. I would have done a lot of project engineering work, uh, scoping out procedures for saturation divers to execute subsea, um, and a lot of process knowledge, which people, you know, I, I dealt a lot with intricate PNIDs, developing isolation plans, and, and looking at process flows and all that kind of stuff, and. Um, that, that stuff is, is very much transferable. So um, that's that's the oil and gas piece in a nutshell. Um, so following that, the, the oil and gas industry probably hit a bit of a downturn. Um, I had almost 10 years away from Ireland and uh, an opportunity uh, aligned itself to, to move back to, to Dublin. And um, I joined BMS as a, a manager in the engineering rel reliability team. Um, that was a massive change for me. Um, you know, I, I working in a GMP environment was totally different to working on the back deck of a of a boat in the middle of the North Sea. Um, you know, really, really had to kind of fast track myself and cross skill myself fairly quickly there. Um, and it was also my first direct people management position. I was responsible for ten technicians working on the uh, in the in the maintenance in, in the manufacturing plant. Um, so people management, uh, coaching, development, objective setting, all new to me. Um, but um, you know, got up to speed pretty quickly. Um, within two years, I was promoted to the position I'm in now as, as reliability SME, and you know that would be responsible for a whole host of elements of a reliability program across the the, the 130 acre campus. Um, spare part inventory, uh, statutory programs in terms of pressure plant and lifting equipment compliance predictive maintenance and condition-based maintenance technologies, uh, IoT, machine learning, digital enhancements to reliability programs. And, and again, there's um, a people management as aspect of that role as well. I would have specialists, um, engineering stores team and graduates in my team as well. Um, I guess the skill sets you develop in that role kind of move on to another level uh, in terms of people management. Uh, you, you need to, to de develop your strategic thinking um, how to deploy programs and, and your business acumen as well needs to kind of progress. Um, so just this, this slide here is kind of some of the key competencies I see, you know, been relevant for an engineer and anybody who's done their chartership will probably recognize these as well, that these are the, the kind of companies that set the framework within your chartership application and they're there for a reason. They absolutely are applicable. Um, so you know when we talk there's a lot of talk these days about using technology and absolutely it's going to be the, the way forward so machine learning artificial intelligence iot we we need to kind of streamline the the, the ways we, we work um working smarter not harder is a term we all use um but this, this will technology is going to help us here so we we need to innovate and move with the times um solution and analysis and solution of complex engineering problems. So I would encourage everybody apply your knowledge, whether that's gained in an academic or in a work setting. Um, you know, we all we all need to use a kind of a systematic approach to, to problem solving and not kind of dive in uh, head first. Um, and, you know, look, look at the bigger picture um, use your, your, your tools available to you like RCAs and fish bones and, and stuff like that. Um, Shane, you have your hand up there. Do you want to jump in? No, it's okay, Karen. I was talking to Maureen. Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, so uh, le leadership, uh, another key aspect of, of any kind of engineering role, I would say, is as you progress in your career. Um, you know, if you're when you're managing projects, you need to understand the impact of accurate cost reporting, uh, cost, time, resources, budgeting, really, really important. Um, from a leadership perspective, you know, leading with integrity is, is important and, and you need to kind of 
listen to your, your workforce to, to keep them engaged. Um, communication and interpersonal skills, I, I spoke about how key that was to my, my offshore work, and not, not just that, you know, obviously into my current work with BMS as well. Um, I would encourage anybody who's the opportunity to work with diverse cultures to do that. Um, I would have gained good experience delivering project briefings and toolbox talks, leading huddle meetings, all that kind of stuff to kind of develop my communication skill set. Um, something actually that, that Derek spoke about, I think is absolutely key as well, is, is developing relationships, engaging with key stakeholders. Um, you are absolutely not going to know everything. Um, so you need to know the people to ask, to, to answer the questions that you don't know the answer to. Um, and, and that's that's what stakeholder engagement is all about. Um, and finally then, you know, something we have to be aware of as engineers, uh, you know, professional conduct, obligations to society uh, and profession and the environment. So engineering principles, standards and procedures are absolutely important. Again, you're not going to know them inside out, but you need to have an appreciation for what's out there and what applies to your, to your roles. Um, safe ways of working, absolutely you know, core to any engineers working in whatever industry you're in. Um, I guess sustainability is a key uh, aspect of, of an engineer and of an engineer going forward in today's world as well. Um, STEM and CPD, which I'll talk about as well, and another area which which um, I, I would be um, quite passionate about as well, and probably leads on to the the next slide here. Um, just wanted to touch on it. Um, STEM is an area I, I'm quite passionate about. I would be a member of the BMS CSR team and the STEM pillar specifically. So I would have worked with Engineers Ireland, working and organizing a lot of events for Engineers Week, uh, the Young Engineers Award. And um, I see all this as you know STEM promotion, but also at, at the early stages of talent pipelining. So I'm also the lead for the science and engineering program in, in BMS. And um, I see the, the the talent that that we've got in that program coming from colleges like like UCD. Um, so we we actually just recently closed our applications for the program for this year, but it will be open next year. So um, I encourage anybody who's interested in working for a company like BMS to reach out to me or, or look at the, the careers website and BMS to to learn a little bit more about that program. Um, I also work as a STEM officer with the. Engineers Ireland Process and Chemical uh, Committee as well, um, which some of the members are here. So they, the message there, I just encourage people to get involved with STEM promotion. And, and if you're interested, uh, become a member uh, with, a, with, a, with a divisional committee with EI just to, to kind of do some networking and, and raise your profile a bit. Um, so, so my last slide kind of just summarizing some, some of my advice. Um, I, don't be afraid to diversify your career um, you know and you can see that with everybody who's spoken here there's such a diversity in where you know people have their, their career paths have led them so you know never think that you can't switch industry just because you're, because you're in a certain industry and, and think that you don't have the the skill set to, to move um, you know be be open-minded to, to change and you know trust your your competencies and your transferable skills you've developed as I said whether that's in academia or, or in placements you've worked in or, or you know career experience whatever and um, you know you, you probably don't do yourselves enough justice on, on the kind of softer skills you develop and um, as I said very important to, to network where you can where you where possible raise your profile um, and then finally maximize your CPD so uh, don't, don't think when you graduate that's the end of your, your study. Um, for me, it, it has helped, um, and I'm not saying it's for everybody, but you know, stuff like your, your chartership, uh, I, I was kind of keen to, to get boxed off. Um, and, and that could be little small bits of training in house, which are wherever you end up. Um, it doesn't have to be big, big huge degrees or, or masters or anything like that. Just, just keep relevant and, and, and move, with, move with the times, keep yourself upskilled. Um, so that's actually the, that's the last slide. Um, I think we're going to open back up uh, for questions uh, with the wider group. So um, Shane, will we'll pass it over to you, I guess. 
Great, thank you, Karen. So we have a couple of questions in. I'm going to put them to you as a panel as such and feel free to answer them and then we'll see if there are any other questions after that. One of the first ones was, if you are interviewing a graduate for a job or looking at their CV, what would you be looking for on that CV or when you're interviewing them that might make them stand out? Yeah, I, I'll, I might jump in and take that. I've interviewed a lot of graduates over the last couple of years and um, done a lot of shortlisting on CVs. Uh, so I, I guess the, the type of stuff I, I would look out for, um, industry placements and experience can be beneficial, but I like more so I'm probably looking for people who have a bit of work ethic in them, um, whether that can be across the board, whether it can be industry relevant or not relevant. Um, you know, I, 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 some CVs stand out to me before I see guys who, who have worked on a farm or, or, or worked in restaurants and, and you just know from reading the CV that they, they're not afraid to get to get stuck in um, and, and that work ethic is there and, and willing to learn. So um, that's a small bit of advice, again, thinking off the top of my head that that stands out. So. Um, yeah, I, think I can uh, follow, follow up there as well. So I think for myself, now this is true of anyone that 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 I've ever interviewed, but particularly with graduates where there's maybe not a like a strong history of work experience, just because you know it's early days. But for me, very much I would hire based on attitude, um, kind of similar to what Kieran was saying. So you know, I'm not looking necessarily for you know. The people with like the highest grades or you know even like the work experience you know it's nice it kind of gives them something to talk about but actually the I suppose questions that I pay most attention to are the questions where uh, I get a sense of how that person will like interact with other people so you know often there are questions around you know um, experiences of maybe conflict when they were kind of delivering something as part of a team or a time when they got, uh, you know, constructive criticism and had to act on it and so on. So I think definitely, uh, you know, trying to get a little bit of, you know, their kind of like personality and an understanding of how they'll gel with it within the team is uh, certainly what I'd look for, to be honest, across the board, but but even more so with with graduates. I might just add to that, Jessica. Um, I'm actually in the middle of reviewing CVs for um, graduates and interns. And the big one for me is a good cover letter that shows that someone has done the research in the company. And it's not just that you're kind of applying for every job, you're applying for this job and you want to come work for this company. That's that's my big thing. If you're applying for, make sure it's specific to the company you apply for. A couple of tweaks to your CV to make sure it's applicable to the job that you're applying for. Make sure the keywords are there. Very good. Dervra, do you want to add anything to that? or? No, I think they've covered it all. It's it's Very based good. on attitude and ability to work or willingness to work. Fantastic. Another question, and this is probably aimed towards James and Kieran more. Do you believe that the oil gas industry will be in a viable will be a viable goal to work for in the 10 years to come? Or does the growth of renewable energy usage make it too risky with not enough jobs? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I probably seen that that that's why I kind of left the industry in Aberdeen because it, it was it was at a downturn. It probably hasn't really recovered to the, the extent that it was at. Um, so in the next ten years, yeah, it, renewable um, energy is probably going to grow. Uh, green energy. Um, at the same time, if you thought there was a, a route into a kind of an oil and gas company or a role. I wouldn't dismiss it because a lot of the, the the skill sets you would use as an oil and gas offshore engineer they're very transferable whether it's oil and gas or um you know offshore wind it's everything subsea uh, it's all kind of subsea operations um so yeah I, I, there's like anton we said this evening so much of this stuff is transferable um but it look it's, it is likely going to move to, to renewable focus as we as we progress you know um, I think one thing just to add to that is um, the oil and gas jobs that are out there at the minute, the money that was in them, say, 10 years ago, uh, you're on substantially less money these days. So mm -hmm. for the hardship of being away from home, uh, flying everywhere, um, it's not the, the great career that it used to be. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, great. I might expand that question further and say, where do you see Ireland in particular going in the next 10 years? We Biotechnology has probably been the big one for certainly the last 10 years. What do you think might be the next 10 years that a lot of these graduates might find themselves involved in? I think if you look at what's coming with even the government development plans, it's going to be looking at renewables. It's going to be looking at data centers. There's still data centers want to land here. So they're, they're the big technologies that are landing into the country at the minute. Um, I am aware, like with within the biopharma industry, that's not going away either. There's still significant investments that are going to be coming in the pipeline. A lot of the investments that are on on pause at the minute, it's just because there's a skill shortage. The actual labour market isn't there. Yeah, I, I think like we 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 are an island. You know, it's 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 pretty obvious that we have the infrastructure. Well, we don't have the infrastructure, but we have massive capabilities and capacities for offshore wind generation and um, we, we, we probably just don't have the infrastructure to take in the amount that we could generate on, on the national grid so there's probably a bit of work to do there but that's going to generate work as well so um, I think naturally Ireland is be, going to become a hub for renewable and offshore tidal energy in, in years to come yeah. Yeah, I, I'd agree with Kieran and Derek. And the other thing I'd say is like, I think we'll see kind of further, I suppose, evolution within the kind of bio and pharma, bio pharma space into things like cell and gene therapies. Um, so where the cell itself is the medicine and not just the, the protein product that, that it's producing. So I do think there'll be further developments there and Ireland will be kind of, I suppose, very well placed to, to I suppose, host um, that manufacturing as well. Very good. Another question, which possibly asking a biased audience, but how important is it to be geographically mobile in your, in your certainly in your first couple of years? I suppose for, for myself, I would say, um, you know, like I think things come, come down to choices. I think without being very mobile, um, you can still have a have a really good career. You know, the more mobile you are, the more opportunities that are that are open to you and, and you can seize the day. But for myself, like I love traveling from a pleasure point of view, but like I've known I've always wanted to, I suppose, live and and work in Ireland. And I always have. And, you know, apart from two years in uh, Merck and Clamel, I've um, well, I'm actually originally from Arklo, but, you know, I, I've been in Dublin since I was uh, 18, you know, so kind of I suppose I feel I've had a like a career that I've really enjoyed and has been interesting. I think, yeah, I could have maybe like pushed it further and faster and, and harder if I had been willing to travel more. But, um, you know, it really just comes down to personal choice. And like there are so many opportunities within Ireland and it's a relatively small country. I don't think it has to particularly hold you back. The only thing I would add to that is, um, as Karen mentioned about diversity and all that, um, the life experience of living away from home, experiencing a different culture, the, the amount you learn from it, just from an actual personal point of view rather than a professional point of view, um, I'd say I'm a completely different person to the person who went to Australia 10 years ago. And for that, I'd say a better person. And would you recommend working abroad early in your career or perhaps taking some time in Ireland first and then going abroad? Well, I know everyone is different and it depends on the opportunities, but any thoughts on that? Generally abroad, if you're going away, you're, you're going away for better money. So um, early in your career, you could, you could get good savings behind you that will set you up if you do get away early. Yeah, I also think earlier can be easier because, you know, I think as you as you kind of move on through your career, you know, you have further ties There might be family or you might have bought a house and there's financial ties and so on. So I think it's definitely easy to do early on um, or easier maybe to, to do early on and then you can bring back the, the experience. So but, you know, I, I, I think there's benefit to it whenever you do it. Yeah, I, I think I would agree. If if you had a choice, maybe early on is probably the, the best time. But uh, I think what Jessica said as well, it's it is personal preference. I don't think if you turn around and say you, you didn't want to do that, you could build it an absolutely fantastic career for yourself by staying in Ireland as well with the opportunities that are there. And um, you know, it's not going to limit your your career progression. I would say it's, it's personal preference. 
And a question that's come up, um, and I know um, Derval answered it at one point, it's contract versus staff. Whether you go staff with a company, whether you go contract, whether you should look for a staff job as your first job and then perhaps look at contract further down the line. Anyone uh, thoughts on that? I'd go the opposite. I'd say <laughs> contract early days. Um, for, for want of a better word, you're not going to get into the big companies. Um, you're going to be very, very lucky if you get into one of the big um, established companies that have good packages um, early days. Um, you will need to do the contract and build your network, build your CV, and then you can actually get headhunted by them. So contracting, you will make more money early days and you have better career opportunities. And it's quicker progression as well. The 12-month contract as a junior engineer, 12 months after that, you're a senior engineer. That doesn't happen in a staff job. Uh, I kind of, I suppose I would feel it kind of depends on like where your interests lie. So again, like certain roles will have uh, a much higher kind of percentage who will be on contract. So, you know, if you're working maybe in kind of validation or commissioning, a lot of those roles um, are contracting. And then, you know, if you're maybe for like, want to start your career as, as a, a bioprocess associate on, on the manufacturing floor, you know, it might be a, a contract, but maybe not in, in the true sense of kind of contracting. You might be on contract, but it'll often lead to, to a permanent role. So I think partly it, it depends on what you're doing. But again, like certainly early on in your career, I don't think oh, uh, early on your, in, in your career, I don't think uh, it, it, it matters too much. But again, it's just kind of later on as kind of considerations around family, mortgages, things like that come in. I think the permanent roles do um, make things maybe a bit, a bit easier there, but it's certainly not impossible. Like you can still build a, a really good career and, and, you know, access things like family and mortgages and so on while contracting. So um, I think, again, a lot is personal preference. Derek, if we had a vote right now for most popular speaker, you'd win it outright. No problem. Cheers. The yeah, it's nothing to do with you. Speech. Yeah, it's nothing to do with you. No. He's going to answer the next question, I think, Shane, if you want to ask him. <laughs> yeah, what, where do you see the career in 20 years' time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Career in 20 years' a, time? No, no, no. We had a question about the nuclear energy industry, and does anyone see any opportunities that this industry will come to Ireland in the future? I I actually can kind of almost answer that. My wife is close to the renewables energy sector. Um, there's no appetite within the government to actually bring renew, um, nuclear to Ireland. And if you're going to apply for planning permission to land a nuclear plant within 100, 100 kilometres of your home, do you reckon planning permission will go go ahead? It's unlikely in this country. Could be 500 miles and you still wouldn't be yeah. too keen on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually worked in the nuclear industry in Finland, believe it or not, as a chemical engineer. So there are opportunities in it, but uh, we don't think they're in Ireland in the near future anyway. Okay, folks, I think that's all the questions answered. Very good. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank the four speakers. Fantastic spe speeches. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Dr. Philip Donnellan. He's laid up at, in hospital at the moment, but he's organized this event for you. So thanks, Philip and also to Maureen for coordinating the whole event. So I hope you had some, I hope some knowledge came to you from this. It is being recorded, I do believe. So if you want to see it again, or if you have any questions for the speakers that you weren't able to ask at the moment, we'll organize that for you at a later date. Okay, folks, thanks for that. Thanks, Shane.